Listen, I, my name is Doug McConnell, and um, uh, I've uh, been asked and invited, and I'm thrilled to be here just to play a, a tiny little introductory role before we bring up uh, Dr. Patton to talk about, you know, the legacy of this uh, great university's connection to our park service and Yosemite and the Grinnell surveys and the resurveys and the things that uh, Lisa was talking about just a few minutes ago. So it's my job just to take uh, no more than two hours to do a short introduction. <laughs> I kinda, uh, unfortunately, these are topics that I have a lot of passion for, so it's easy for me to get way carried away. So I promise to try to bring it under control and, and turn it over uh, to Jim, who really knows what he's talking about. Um, my, uh, my, um, very quickly, uh, I'm uh, a fourth generation Californian on my mom's side. My, Great grandparents came not long after the university was established uh, in 1868. Lot, I think they drove the uh, Golden Spike in the Transcontinental Railroad in Promontory Point, Utah, and my family was on the next train across the country and came out to Northern California. So we've been here often on all these years since. And, um, and I have just a huge affection for the University of California and for our national park system as well as for Yosemite in particular. And just uh, sort of to be here, I feel I'm home when I'm in this university, though only my wife is actually a Cal grad in our family. I went to a little place called Pomona College in Southern California. Um, but, uh, but I love this university, and I love its tradition and heritage and the work that's done here, and I always feel at home when I walk uh, onto the campus, and I feel very much at home in Yosemite. That's uh, a place where I literally uh, grew up. Um, and so to talk about these two places of, of huge affection for me is the easiest thing to do on the, in the world. Um, I'm just curious, how many of you are actually Cal students or Cal grads? in this crowd. Well, not bad. And how many are Pomona College? Uh, there we go. There's a sage in back there. We're, <laughs> um, and then how many of you have been to Yosemite National Park? Wow. Very, very. Oh, well, it's, it's so great. Well, we all share this passion, so I don't have to go on at great length. You all know exactly these places that we're talking about, and you're part of this lineage that has so enriched uh, where we live as well as the world. Uh, the, this university and our park system uh, are two of the finest institutions this country has ever generated. Um, for me personally, uh, I just have to just uh, talk a little bit about Yosemite and my, my passion for it. And uh, as a kid growing up, my dad was a car dealer. And so we, we were back, I did a show called Bay Area Backwards on TV here for a long time. <laughs> These are all my family members applauding. I appreciate that. Uh, but basically, I was just doing what I got a chance for a living, what I got a chance to do as a kid, which is to get in the back seat of my mom and dad's car and go see mostly our parks and public you know, open spaces and, and to fall in love with the great landscapes of America. And most particularly, uh, Yosemite was our prime touchstone. Uh, and 60, year, 60 years ago this year, which is hard for me to believe, I was eight years old, we moved to Fresno. And the greatest thing about Fresno was Yosemite, Sequoia, Kings Canyon were literally right outside my back door. And so we were in those mountains all the time, but in particular Yosemite. Yosemite was our place. I figured that it was actually my own private national park. That uh, we would, uh, dad would get off of work on a Friday afternoon, we'd go almost every summer weekend into Yosemite, often in the wintertime, and you know, put our little trailer, we had a little 15 foot trailer, and we would uh, get on a little Highway 41 and drive up into Yosemite, uh, stop by the Mariposa Grove and try to hug some big trees, and then head along, wind our way past Badger Pass, and, and then come through that incredible tunnel view entry into Yosemite National Park. And when I came through it, it was, uh, that was my Disneyland. That was my magical kingdom. That was my happiest place on earth. I saw El Capitan and Half Dome and the Bridal Veil vale and the Valley and the high country beyond, and I, I was in love. I was, it had me at hello. It forged a relationship for me over those many, many, many years of going and being in that park that uh, a love of nature that has fueled my entire life, has guided and dictated what I've done with my life. And I just, uh, I'm a very, very, very lucky guy to have had those experiences as a, as a young boy. Uh, by the way, before I go a tiny bit further, I'm, I'm going to end soon, but I want to acknowledge one of my dearest and best friends, Mr. Bob Hansen right over here. Bob? 
Bob Hansen was the founding uh, executive director and for 20 years led the extraordinary, in those days called Yosemite Fund, the great nonprofit that was supporting our national park up there and building trails and improving habitats. Uh, Bob retired from that uh, about four years ago, uh, still engaged and involved in our national parks. But Bob, you and the fund and now the Yosemite Conservancy have done amazing work on behalf of our national park, a great park partner. So it's just great to have Bob here uh, tonight. But uh, one of the things I, was, I mentioned that because we'd get into Yosemite Valley in the 1950s you could drive up on a Friday night, almost always go right to our very own personal campsite. It had the McConnell family name on it, right? It was called Camp 14. It was right next to the Merced River. And we would park right there. And then what did I have in front of me? My front yard was Stoneman Meadow, right? And I personally, and Bob knows this, I personally trashed that meadow. I destroyed that meadow on my own over the years we'd go in there, running around it, playing on the meadow. Uh, you know, the statute of limitations is over. I can't be arrested. But I have done everything in my power to support Bob and the, and the fund and the conservancy and the park service to restore that meadow and bring it back to the life it really deserves. And of course, right in front of that was Glacier Point. And which is magnificent in and of itself, but back in my day, we had, I have to say I loved it, the old fire falls. Every night, the fire would fall off of Glacier Point, and uh, I was in heaven. And then, some, uh, probably three or four times every summer, my mom and dad and I would hop in the car and go up, and how many of you remember, before 1961, the old Tioga Road? How many of you, some of you are my age, you went, you went on the old Tioga Road? Well. These days, you can zip right over Highway 120, Tioga Pass, and you can get to Tuolumne Meadows, and it's, it's gorgeous, it's wonderful, and you can hike in all directions, and it's magnificent. Back in those days, it was about a lane and a half dirt road, an old wagon road, and it would take us, it seemed like about four hours. But for me, it was the greatest adventure in life. I was, I was in a world of imagination and nature and beauty, and getting up to the high country, it was like going it was going to Africa, it was going to the Antarctica, it was going to the best places there are in the world, and I got to be there as this, as this little kid. And so, over the years, coming back out of Yosemite, uh, we then traveled, my wife and I lived all over the place, came back here 30 years ago next week uh, with the uh, chance to kind of fall in love with Northern California all over again and to get back into that park as often as, as possible to tell stories, to take my children, to pass that next generation. Uh, they will take theirs as we go from generation to generation. Uh, that park nurtured me, it cared for me, and I just want to do everything in my power to help nurture it and care for it and have it pass the lessons it has to teach us on for generations to come. And the, the great work that's being done here at the university to continue the research that began with Joseph Grinnell and others, Lacant and others before, uh, is incredibly important, and we're learning so much from it. And, and so I just, when I'm invited to come here, I just was uh, thrilled to do it. As uh, Lisa was saying, 150th anniversary next year of the Yosemite grant, Abraham Lincoln you know, writing and you know, saying, okay, Yosemite Valley is going to be in some way protected, uh, the Mariposa Grove, uh, and then uh, in, in 2015, we'll be celebrating the 125th anniversary of, uh, of Yosemite. I have to also say here, equal time, it will also be the 125th anniversary of our second national park. Yellowstone was first. Our second national park, close but not exactly Yosemite, was Sequoia National Park. So be sure you get to Sequoia and Kings Canyon as well. Uh, but then, the, so 2015, the, uh, the uh, 125th anniversary of our beautiful national parks, and then on 1916, extraordinarily important for all of us to get involved in the 100th anniversary of our national park system that in so many ways was born right in this place. So with that, that's my, uh, and then the other two hours I'll do uh, later on for anybody who you know, wants to be, but it is now my privilege to get out of the way uh, to have somebody come up who really knows what he's talking about. And um, I'm going to, Jim, I'm just going to do this real quickly. Uh, there's so much that we can say uh, about Dr. James L. Patton. Uh, he is an uh, evolutionary biological mammologist. Uh, a biologist and mammologist, uh, emeritus professor of integrative biology and curator of, the, of mammals at the Museum of Integrative uh, uh, Zoology here. Best known, really, for his uh, pioneering work on the evolution of rodents. 
especially uh, pocket mice and pocket gophers, uh, and the diversification of rainforest uh, uh, faunas. Uh, and now, and also, and terribly important now in the continuing work of this university, the impact of climate change on, uh, on mammals here in North America. And, and Jim, correct me if I'm wrong on this, uh, but I tried to count the number of, uh, of, of, of critters who uh, in some way bear his name. And uh, so his name is attached to a genus of uh, neotropical rat, and six species of everything from rodents to a bat to a snake and to a fossil porcupine. You're the only person who has that many uh, relatives that bear your name in, in our animal kingdom. Uh, he's also uh, authored uh, 200 scientific uh, uh, publications, nearly 200. And as of 2005, he had collected uh, and uh, deposited nearly 20,000 specimens. Uh, in the museum from uh, the western U.S. and 14 other countries, making him the most prolific collector of mammal specimens the museum has ever had in its long and rich history. And it's my pleasure to introduce, to talk about Grinnell and his surveys, the connection of this university to the great founding of the uh, National Park Service and Yosemite in particular, Dr. James L. Patton. <laughs> Now we got to get this out. Yeah. This is the, the biggest challenge will be just changing the microphones. <laughs> okay. We've got it. Okay. Is that okay? You know, I mean, decades ago I used to lecture in this room to do the general biology class, and I had a big voice then. I didn't need a microphone. But <laughs> Thank you, Doug. Thank you for that kind introduction, and thank you all for coming tonight. I have to say that I'm a little bit intimidated on several grounds for standing in front of you. The first is, uh, I'm in my 45th year here on the Berkeley campus, but I only started to work in Yosemite in 2003. I mean, before that time, the times I visited Yosemite was on Highway 120 going over to the east side to get to the desert to do something really interesting. <laughs> at least I thought so at that time. And I spent most of my academic career uh, working in South America, so it really wasn't until after I retired uh, when I got engaged in this study, and Doug is absolutely right. Once you see Yosemite, you experience Yosemite in any context, you are immediately captivated, and I've been going back every year, uh, still hiking in the high country, and I still, I mean, I... Even at my decrepit old age, I'm still able to work most of the trails in the high country. So that's the first reason I'm a little bit uh, uh, intimidated. So there, the second reason, of course, is that there are a lot more of you in the audience who know far more about Yosemite than I will ever know because at my advanced age, I can't remember things very much anymore. <laughs> and so my third area of intimidation is worrying about, you know, if I'm going to have how many senior moments I'm going to have standing up. <laughs> but we'll try. So anyway, what I wanted to talk about is the connection. Uh, I was asked to talk in part about the connection of UC in, in general to Yosemite. Uh, but specifically, uh, what I want to talk about is, um, is Joseph Grinnell and his connection to Yosemite. So let me see if I can work this. Um, if you don't know, uh, Ken Brower, who is, is the son of David Brower of uh, Sierra Club and Friends of the Earth fam uh, fame and so forth, uh, wrote an article for the Cal Alumni Magazine, California, back in 2006, in which he talked about the resurvey effort that we were engaged in at the time. But he gave this timeline of the relationship between um, the university and, uh, and the park. And as Doug says, and as uh, Lisa said in her remarks uh, before we came in here, uh, this relationship starts the year that UC was founded in 1868, and it's continuing to today. I had, I gave this, uh, I gave a talk some years ago to the, um, to the uh, to the organization for museum collections, in which I highlighted uh, this timeline, and I put these red boxes around particular years. I'm not going to go into that now. If you're interested, uh, you can go to, uh, you can get on the web and go to the California Magazine website and download. Uh, uh, Ken's uh, talk. What I really want to do is center on this individual who's Joseph Grinnell. Uh, most of you, I assume, know who Joseph Grinnell is, but if you don't, I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. He was clearly one of the greatest, if not the greatest, naturalist of the early 20th century. 
Uh, he was the founding director of the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology. Uh, he was selected by the benefactrix who uh, started the museum with a donation to the university in 1908, uh, Annie Alexander, and he served as director from 1908 until 1939 when he had, um, he died of a, of, an early, of a heart attack at the age of 62. He's generally recognized for having the training that he, um, in, in his training of, of uh, scholars who are now distributed around the world at many generations later. Most mammologists and most ornithologists in this country, for example, trace their academic lineage back directly back to Grinnell. I'm one of the few mammologists who does not. I was actually trained by a Drosophila geneticist of all things. <clears throat> So he had a profound influence on the distribution of the scholarship of uh, uh, higher vertebrate uh, biology across the US and even internationally. He's well known for his detailed field studies of species distributions, uh, which allowed him to encapsulate for the first time two of the core principles uh, of the general field of ecology, and that is uh, the idea of the ecological niche, that there is a set of environmental parameters that define the range uh, that limits species, uh, and also the, um, the idea of competitive exclusion, that no two species can occupy that same space at the same time without one uh, competitively out competing the, I mean, uh, competitively out competing. See, I told you, <laughs> I haven't talked before a class in a long time, or my students would have not nailed me to the wall for that one. He emphasized recording observations as well as collecting specimens. In fact, as I'll show you in a second, uh, it's, he believed his, his observational record was more important than the specimen record. And he promoted cons a conservation ethic uh, in the United States based on the maintenance of natural processes. And that comes into play really importantly uh, in terms of the National Park Service. Now I'll step back uh, a moment. Uh, most of you have probably seen uh, Ken Brower, I mean Ken Brower, uh, uh, Ken Burns' uh, uh, exquisite uh, series on NPS, NPR. Phew. Relax, Jim. Um, <laughs> on uh, the national parks. And Lisa mentioned some of these uh, individuals in her comments earlier. But here are four of the prominent individuals uh, that were mentioned that, that uh, Burns highlighted in his uh, documentary uh, having to do with the formation of the National Park Service and including uh, Yosemite specifically. Franklin Lane, who was the Secretary of the Interior uh, at the time that the Park Service was founded in 1916. Stephen Mather, uh, who was um, a special executive assistant to, uh, to Lane, who became the first uh, uh, director of the National Park Service, and he served until his death in 1929. Horace Albright, uh, who was Mather's assistant director, took over for Mather when he was sick at periods of time, and then became the second director of the National Park Service, and George Melendez Wright. Now, one of the things that you can see on this slide, one of the things that ties all of these people together is that they're all Berkeley products. Okay. Lane didn't graduate from here, but he spent three years of his undergraduate career here. Uh, but Mather did, Albright did, and Wright did. Albright and Wright were both students, or at least took Grinnell's courses. And Wright in particular, I'll say a little bit more about him in a moment, uh, was more deeply engaged directly with Grinnell. Now when the, when the National Park Service was founded, um, Mather's goal was to promote uh, tourism to the parks because at that time the, the idea of the parks was under heavy uh, assault uh, from the commercial industries of this country, mining, grazing, uh, the timber industry and so forth for exploitation and they were not happy with having land set aside in perpetuity that could not be accessed for commercial gain. And Mather put in place a system to engage the public to the parks because he realized that, the, that um, the parks could not survive as an entity unless the average American was behind the parks as a concept. And so he spent his time actually developing the infrastructure in the early days of the park system, the roads, the, tr the transportation networks to get people to the park, uh, the big hotels and the parks and so forth. Albright, uh, on the other hand, behind the scenes, uh, and then while he was director, emphasized more 
the wilderness values of the park rather than the people values of the park and tried to marry those two. And he specifically brought in George Wright uh, to become uh, the head of the wildlife division, the nascent wildlife division in the park. <clears throat> now Wright um, died of a very early, uh, very early in his life. He was only 31 years old and he was killed in an automobile accident in southern New Mexico. He was an undergraduate here, as I said. He was a curatorial, what today would amount to a curatorial assistant in the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology. He was paid $50 a semester uh, to serve as the assistant to the economic mammologist at that time, who was uh, Joseph Dixon, who went on to be a luminary in the natural park system. Uh, economic mammalogy was not how many deer you can raise, it was how you can protect the deer that are out there in the nat natural environment. Uh, so it has a different connotation than it would be today. But Wright founded, or was the first um, director of the wildlife division of the park, and I just have this quote in a paper that he wrote in 1935, uh, the, day, the year before he died. And he says, the joint occupation of the national parks by animal and human populations is prescribed by the organic laws which define the national parks. That's the organic 1916 Organic Act. Uh, maintenance of wildlife in the primitive state is also inherent in the natural national park concept. The conclusion is undeniable that failure to maintain the natural status of natural park faunas um, in spite of the presence of large numbers of visitors would also be a, would be a failure to the whole national parks idea. So he was a committed conservationist. And the George Wright Society, which is a society of parks and other, I guess, other government uh, agency personnel, as somebody can correct me, uh, was founded on the basis of you know, his name and they, and they published the George Wright Forum, which is a journal uh, for uh, dissemination of, of uh, ideas about park, park management and so forth. Now Grinnell's role in the founding of the parks and the, and the parks wildlife management ethos uh, stems from these three components, at least these three components, of, for which he was a vocal advocate. He advocated the parks as wildlife preserves, and I don't mean preserving what's there today in perpetuity. I mean preserving the system that occurs there and allowing it to, to change naturally. So he directly influenced the policies that were being developed by Albright and Wright. And he did that initially because these guys were taking his courses as undergraduates here. And then he promoted, continued to promote that when they went on in the park service. He advocated for the parks as a venue, as a venue to teach the public about the natural environment. While Mather may have been concerned about the public's engagement in the parks for its scenic beauty and so forth, Grinnell was concerned about the public's engagement in the parks for its conservation, its wildlife value, its ethereal value in terms of the natural environment. And then the third thing is that Grinnell uh, was a strong advocate for the concept of wilderness where natural biological processes would be allowed to, to operate unimpeded. He was a strong opponent of the then federal policies for predator control, for fire suppression, for mining, for grazing, timber harvest, and other aspects, commercial aspects that would impinge on the natural environment of the park, and not just in the parks themselves, but in the surrounding federal lands, because he realized that the parks can't serve as an island surrounded by destruction. And so he was a strong advocate uh, of those elements. <clears throat> and this uh, um, is a long quote, and I'm, I'm not going to read it to you because otherwise we'll be here all day. But one of Grinnell's students, Lowell Sumner, who was a park naturalist for his entire career, summarized Grinnell's role uh, in development of that wildlife program and management program in the parks uh, concept in the early days uh, in a paper that he published in the George Wright Forum in 1983. And he points out in here that not only did Grinnell himself advocate for these positions, but he trained lots of students who were the effective on the ground people that developed the program and maintained the program at the park themselves. One of his first students was Harold Bryant, for example. He became, he was the assistant director of the of the Park Service. I hate these things. Um, and he became the first chief of the branch of research and education 
Bryant was dedicated to educating the public about wildlife biology. George Wright, we've already mentioned. I'm gonna... Can you hear me? Yes. Cool. I can still talk loud. <laughs> so George Wright, we've already mentioned. Ben Thompson, formerly of the Wild Division and then Assistant Director. Joseph Dixon, the park's famous, um, famed field naturalist. Uh, a whole bunch of, of uh, Park Service biologists, Eddie Burrell, uh, Stevenson, and Sumner himself, were all students of Grinnell. So he, had, he not only advocated to the public, but he had a direct influence uh, on the people that, that were part of the Park Service in the natural environment system. And the books that, that Grinnell published also had that influence. Grinnell published these books, I'll show you the, the animal life in the Yosemite in a second, not as field guides because they didn't have those kinds of things in those days. I mean, Animal Life in the Yosemite is 900 or 700 pages and it weighs about five pounds. It's not something you're going to stick in a back pocket and go take on a backpack trip. Uh, but he wrote that book explicitly for the general reader. He wanted people to be educated about uh, the biological knowledge of the park. So that gets me back to what I want to talk about here. Uh, with, and so I've retitled my talk having to do with uh, Grinnell's view of the past being a record of the future and our attempts to, uh, to realize Grinnell's vision, uh, which is through this Grinnell resurvey project that has been mentioned. Now, we all know, or we should know, um, despite some members of Congress, uh, that climate change is real, it's demonstrable, and there are effects that we can measure and that have been measured. But there's a whole, and there's a, there's a cottage industry that has been developed around climate change, global change in general, and changes in organismal distributions. And there's, there are now hundreds of papers published in the scientific literature that are empirical studies that document elevational or latitudinal range shifts in the species, phenological changes, migration failures, changes in food availability and food web structure, population collapses, and so forth. Most of these studies, however, are compromised to a degree because they're short term, okay? The previous study was done in, in 1995 and now we're doing it today, you know, 20 years later or only 10 years later. We need a deeper time perspective than that. And there are also a whole bunch of studies that have been published on modeling and future scenario that predict into the future large rain shifts, high global extinction rates, reorganized communities and so forth. And just to give you a couple of examples of this, uh, this is a ubiquitous small mammal uh, in uh, pine forest, conifer forest in western North America, the golden mammal ground squirrel. If you've ever tried to eat your lunch in any, in any picnic ground uh, in Yosemite, they'll come up and try and steal your potato chips and so forth. Well, so the black dots on this map above me uh, on the left-hand side are distributional records. Uh, based on those distributional records, we can uh, determine what the climate envelope of this species is. The green area is the highest suitability climate envelope for this species. And so that's today. Uh, we can use one of, any one of the, of the projected scenarios for future climate change based on the IPCC uh, projections like the Hadley A2 and project ahead to, to 2080 as to where that climate envelope is going to be and you see that it's shrunken down measurably. Uh, the species is very likely by this scenario alone uh, to go extinct in the Sierra Nevada for example. So this is a predicted range of class. So we have these kinds of studies but we don't know how real they are. We also have this kind of a study, which was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences 10 years ago, that looked at change in the mammal fauna of all the major national parks in, in North America, and it highlighted Yosemite, using the same kind of modeling technique. You determine the range, you determine the climate envelope of that range, you project it forward in time, given a certain climate scenario, and so how many species are going to be lost from the park, and how many species are to be gained? And for Yosemite today, there's 64 mammal species. Six are projected to be lost, so they either move north or up uh, into the uh, stratosphere. Uh, and 25 species are to be gained. So at least on the basis of this study, Yosemite is going to be a richer mammal community uh, 50 years from now uh, than it is today. 
Okay? But again, this is just a projection. The only way we're going to know whether this is valid has any reality is 50 years hence and go back and, and see what, if it is. Well, we can do better than that. And the reason we can do better than that is because Grinnell gave us the record. <clears throat> this is a map of California, obviously. The colored dots are all the localities that Grinnell and his folks visited uh, during Grinnell's tenure uh, from 2008, or a little bit before that, actually, uh, to 19, uh, 2008. From 1908, or a little bit before that, to uh, Grinnell's death in 1939. In a paper that Grinnell published in, in 1910, just two years after he founded the museum, he wrote this. He says, the greatest purpose of our museum, this two-year-old institution, will not be realized until the lapse of many years, possibly a century. And this is that the student of the future will have access to the original record of faunal conditions in California and the West, wherever we now work. That's today. Okay? So he assembled this record, not for himself so much, but for us. And that's pretty cool. I know I wouldn't have that kind of thought process to think of that. He not only thought about that in terms of of actually visiting localities and recording what's there, but he wanted to archive all the information. And so he set up a system to do that. He is, we, we, uh, we have a field uh, a journal uh, notebook system that we call the Grinnell Method uh, that is now in use globally almost. And another paper that he published early on, in this case, uh, the year that the museum was founded, he says our efforts are not to accumulate as, as great a mass of uh, animal remains as possible. So I've, I've skinned 20,000 small mammals, but that's not my legacy. My legacy is, in fact, our field records will perhaps be the most valuable of our results. So we have thousands or hundreds of volumes of field notes, thousands and thousands of pages of detailed journal that record everything that they saw and thought about while they were out there. We have field maps uh, to tell us where they actually had their campsites and where they set their trap lines and so forth. And we have lots and lots and lots of drawings in the field notebooks about behavioral aspects. So here's Belding Brown Squirrel, two behaviors that Charles Camp saw for Belding Brown Squirrels in their alert posture up in Tuolumne Meadows. We also have a rich photographic record that documents the change in the natural environment. So Doug mentioned Stoneman Meadow. Meadow here looking east uh, to uh, a Half Dome and North Dome, a uh, beautiful black oak woodland in, in 1911, uh, and it's an, an very impressive and very uh, or depressive, depending upon one's view, uh, yellow pine forest today. So what we decided to do in 2003 at the request of the National Park Service was go back and revisit uh, Grinnell's Area, uh, localities across uh, California. And so we developed this Grinnell survey project uh, to realize Grinnell's vision. Document current distribution and abundance of terrestrial vertebrates, observe changes in comparison to the past, understand these changes given climate change, landscape changes, whatever, uh, and then use that comparison as a benchmark to project to the future. Rather than just going from today and making assumptions about the future, we can actually have some confidence. Okay. Now, as Doug uh, mentioned, uh, what Grinnell was concerned about really were landscape changes. Um, and this slide is, is uh, to illustrate that. He wasn't thinking about climate change at all. Uh, this is the history of the San Joaquin Valley uh, from pre European times. 1912, the beginning of the expansion of agriculture and urbanization on the east side of the valley uh, to post-World War II uh, to 2000. And you can see in this relatively short time period, uh, there's almost no natural vegetation left on the floor of the San Joaquin Valley. Grinnell was seeing that in his day. In fact, he wrote in 1938, some of our earlier notebooks describe conditions now vanished in the localities they dealt with. And he had this really cool quote that I love uh, in his Mammals of California where he wrote about us uh, in his remarks. He says, humans, disposition aggressive and tendencies destructive, especially with natural habitats, and has named himself homo sapiens, profoundly wise, I want <laughs> So, like I said, Grinnell's concerned about uh, landscape, 
about landscape changes. He wasn't even thinking about the climate. But the climate in California has changed dramatically in the last century. Uh, this is the illustration on the right and on the left uh, is the change in minimum temperature uh, across the, from Nevada through California. Uh, the red means temperature has gone up. Winter temperatures, minimum temperatures have increased. Uh, and that's been permeated throughout most of this area. There are relatively few areas of blue where temperature has actually gone down. And the same thing is true with precipitation. Uh, most of the areas remain relatively the same. There are, relatively, there are a few spots, uh, particularly along the crest of the Sierras, where the precipitation has gone down. Uh, but there are areas uh, on the west side of the Sierras where the precipitation has gone up. And these have profound consequences, not only for the wildlife, but for us. Grinnell would have been really, really interested uh, in these temperature records because in his development of the concept of the ecological niche, he, s he identified temperature as probably being the most important limiting factor for species distribution. And in this classic paper on uh, the niche relationships of the California thrasher, which is a California global endemic, uh, Mediterranean scrub endemic, he said the California thrasher is unquestionably limited in its range in, ult in ultimate analysis by temperature condition. So he would have really been excited by it, uh, knowing the temperature had been changing. But the fact that temperature had been changing and the fact that we have this prediction from Grinnell that temperature is important to species distribution, we can come up with some very simple um, uh, predictions about how species distributions may change as temperatures continue to increase. So latitudinally, high latitude species are expected to shrink northward, or southern ranges are expected to shrink northward. Low latitude species, those from Mexico coming up, are, their upper, I mean their northern limits are expected to expand uh, northward. And the same thing is true on an elevational gradient as opposed to a latitude gradient. High elevation species, their lower limits are expected to contract upwards. Low elevation species, their upper limits are expected to expand upwards. <clears throat> so this is where the, the beauty of the Yosemite transect comes in, and the other transects that Grinnell and his, and his colleagues ran uh, uh, across the Sierra Nevada. The Yosemite transect was done from 1914 to 1915. They spent about 1,000 days in the field in that one year. Wouldn't we love to do that, Jim? <laughs> As faculty members here now, I don't think that's impossible. Uh, uh, 3,000 plus pages of field notes, uh, 4,400 specimens, 700 photographs. They ran a transect with the Lower Merced and Lower Tuolumne Rivers up through the central core of Yosemite, uh, across Tyra Pass, Mono Pass area down to Mono uh, Lake. Uh, they excluded the northern end of the park and the southern end of the park. Uh, and that transect incorporates all of the ecological zones uh, through the Sierra Nevada. In 1924, uh, uh, Grinnell and Tracy Storr uh, published this book called uh, The Animal Life of the Yosemite. Uh, it was published by UC Press. It came out of date, almost out of print, almost immediately. But it's now been uh, digitized by the Park Service, and it's available on the Park Service website. Uh, I went on there two weeks ago to see at the URL, but the Park Service website was closed down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, remark on some of the individual, the key individuals that did the transcript, Grinnell, I've already mentioned. Tracy Storm was one of his students. He went on to, to be the first zoologist hired by UC Davis, and Storr Hall and the Davis campus was named for him. Walter Taylor uh, went on to be uh, a chief member of the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and he is largely responsible for developing the cooperative wildlife programs in the land grant state universities post World War II. Uh, Joseph Dixon, I've already mentioned, as the naturalist in the national park system. Uh, he left Berkeley and, and uh, went there. And, and went Charles there. Camp. And Charles Camp, who was just an undergraduate at this uh, time, went on, uh, went on to get his PhD at Columbia and returned to Berkeley uh, and headed uh, the Paleontology Museum. He is a well, was a world-renowned Lower Berg opinion. And he's the one. Uh, and he's the one who responds to the illustrations in the field. So in in 7 uh, uh, October 1914, Grinnell wrote to the Secretary of the Interior Land. So this is what I'm going to do. Uh, in 
before was the secretary, you said, to a national history survey along with his transect. He wanted to identify all the mammal birds, etc. He wanted to determine their distribution, their habits, and their ecological relationships. And he wanted to publish this uh, permanent record in the form that was attractive to the public. And he recognized that public education was really key, both to the Park Service, but it was his role as a university faculty member to disseminate information to the public. Uh, they responded uh, with a short letter uh, allowing Grinnell, uh, giving Grinnell permission. And a uh, matter was the lead behind making sure that Lane, in fact, uh, gave this agreement. Matter was a member of the Sierra Club and an avid naturalist in his own right, knew Grinnell and uh, supported him very much. Uh, and he actually mattered uh, posted a check for $100 to Grinnell to help underwrite the field expenses. Now, $100 a day is very much, but in 1914, it was a lot. <clears throat> so that transaction was done. All of the data were available. I mean, all collected in a short you know, year's period. Uh, they're all housed in, uh, in the museum. In 2000, in December 2002, I got a telephone call from um, a good friend, Les Chow. Lisa knows very well as a biologist in Yosemite. Uh, he's been a Berkeley graduate student, uh, undergraduate as well. He took my courses, I'm doing well. He called me and said, hey Jim, the uh, Park Service has some money uh, to do a biological inventory work. Uh, would you guys be interested, if you guys be in the museum, be interested in coming back and recapitulating Brunel's uh, original transcript? And I go, my goodness, uh, last time was just literally about ready to lift the phone off the Talk, call you and see about how we can do this because we had the exact same idea. So anyway, uh, in 2003 we started this. Uh, from 2003 to 2005 uh, we revisited all the original 41 sites that are still extant. Some of the original sites are under uh, McClure Reservoir, for example. Uh, but we re revisited all the sites that we could. And then based on what we found, the Park Service wanted me to continue uh, and develop surveys for those parts of the park that have not been surveyed yet. So from 2006 to 2008, uh, we worked along the side of the Sierras and the northern Sierras and then down in the park range uh, in the southern Sierras. And, uh, again, the whole idea is to have a historic record that we can compare to the modern record and where those two meet, uh, we can make some uh, decent projections to the future. Okay, we did the same kind of thing that Riddell did. We set trappers. Upper Lyon, 
all base it and write a tree line and find this animal today. So it has expanded upwards by almost, well, by 850 meters, um, you know, almost 2,700 feet. And it's not only done it here, it's the same expansion that's happened in the White Mountains, for example, just on the east side of the Sierra. It was confined to the uh, Pinion Juniper Woodland and the Grinnell area and down you off the Barcroft land at 12,000 feet. Uh, and it's running across the Alpine Stream. This species also occurs on the west side. These are the species uh, that I, that, for which we've done most of the uh, work on because these are both California endemics, the chipmunks, uh, and uh, they show the biggest contrast in patterns of change over time. <clears throat> so the Oshkosh pine chipmunk occurred all along the length of the Sierra to down in the peninsula and, and one of the, uh, I mean, down in the transverse ranges and one of the peninsula ranges. And it's a common animal. And let me explain these graphs up on the top. The vertical line is the elevation. Uh, the black dots uh, are each of the localities that were surveyed at that elevation. Uh, Grinnell means the historic period, resurveying resurveying means our period. And the colored dots are the localities that have relocated the species and Grinnell located the species. So you can see from the logical uh, pine chipmunk, it hasn't changed its distribution at all. This is a logical pine. Uh, and other upper mixed conifer forest animal up to tree line uh, species. It's got a wide ecological amplitude. On the other hand, the alpine chipmunk, which by its name indicates that it's an alpine specialist largely, has contracted its lower range up by about 1,800 feet. It used to be in the Grinnell days common on these open uh, uh, lush bowl pine uh, uh, forest with a uh, Ran a slab understory or, or opening uh, like at um, uh, Soda Springs in Palm Meadows. This animal was present there then. The red X means it's not present there now. You have to get up two tree lines and above before you find this animal. So it's experienced a significant change. So that the issue is when we see these changes, is trying to determine whether or not they're real or whether or not they're just artifacts of sampling design or something else. You know, Grinnell was a really good naturalist. You can see these animals. I'm a poor naturalist. I can't find it. That kind of thing. So we can use statistical methods that are available to us now to give us some confidence. And so if you gain anything from this lecture at all, I want to remember this formula. <laughs> Parts of the park from 1930 to 2002. The rim 
fire, I don't have a pointer for the rim fire, up there in a, a large section of that unburned area that's now burned. Uh, <clears throat> but you'll notice that most of the fires in the park concentrate in the, on the relatively lower elevations on the western margin of the next conifer forest. There are practically no fires, and those fires that did occur in the high elevations in the area of the Alpine Chipmunk, for example, are limited to very small areas. So the upward elevation of expansion of the West Slope species may be tied in with fire history. Uh, whereas the high elevation species that have been upwards, you can't blame fire history because there haven't been essentially been any fire out there. And this is probably what's happened with this uh, bigger mouse, this pinion mouse on the west side. On the west side, it's not a pinion juniper animal, but there is no pinion juniper on the west side. It's, it's a chaparral animal. <coughs> Restricted to elevations below 30 to 200 feet in the Grinnell days, it's now at Hazel Green on the edge of the park uh, at 5,600 feet. And that whole area around Hazel Green burned uh, a couple of decades ago and converted the mixed conifer forest to the Sea of Chaparral. That's the ideal habitat for this animal. And all of the species that have expanded upwards on the west slope are all chaparral specialists that have moved into this area. And so fire is clearly a problem they have a direct impact on those animals. But that's not true, as I said, for the high elevation species. So we do have signatures, however, of climate change for the high elevation. Here's a paper published by Connie Millar and her colleagues out of the Pacific Southwest Research Station at the Forest Service here in Albany uh, on response to subalpine conifers in the Sierra to climate change. And they note that one of the signatures is increased conifer density, increased conifer invasion of alpine meadows, and changes in growth form of the conifers as you switch from harsh winter conditions to mild winter conditions. And <clears throat> increased conifer density, you can see in this pair of photographs on the north side of the Mobile Side Lake up 10,400 feet, where the uh, white bark pines are staggered and low stature uh, on that rocky escarpment uh, in the Grinnell era in 1915, and look how dense and how tall they are. And uh, the arrow on the lower photograph shows that uh, increased upright growth, which indicates the shift in growth form as a result from warming of winter conditions. Okay, so there are big changes in the conifer forest that suggest a direct climate change. There's also direct evidence for climate change. This is the weather record for the Yosemite Valley. Uh, the upper one is the minimum temperature uh, for all the months uh, across the Century and the bottom graph is the maximum temperature. The bottom graph map, maximum temperature hasn't changed at all in the valley, whether it be in the summertime or the fall or the wintertime or the spring or whatever. But winter temperatures are warming in the valley, both during the wintertime and during the summertime. The minimum January temperature now is 3.9 degrees warmer than it was 100 years ago. The minimum summer temperature is 5.3 degrees. So we have a direct climate record uh, for warming of the minimum temperatures, and that's really important for winter conditions uh, in the Sierra Club. And we also have the record of the glacial melt. Uh, the glaciers in the Central Sierra are about half the size today that they were uh, in uh, 100 years ago. And this is the fly elevation in comparison to photographs of those. Uh, so the next question, question to ask, though, we know that species are changing we know that they might be changing either as a result of uh, landscape changes or climate change. So the next question, can we model this effectively so that we can make predictions to the future? <clears throat> we do this by using geographic information systems where we can combine, for example, the Grinnell era uh, presence absence data. Uh, we can combine that with Grinnell era climate record. We can combine that with the Grinnell era vegetation record whatever other records are available, and project a model based on those combined sets of information. And if we do that for uh, the Alpine Chipmunk, for example, this is the doctoral work of Emily Rubich, who's a student here. So <clears throat> the map on the, on the left is a predictive range of the Alpine Chipmunk during the Grinnell era based on the climate of that era, the vegetation of that era, and the distribution of uh, competitor to other species of chipmunks. And if you take that record then and project it to today's climate to 
today's vegetation, today's co-occurring species of chipmunks, you get this extreme retraction or contraction of the range of the species. So now the question is, this is the prediction, now the question is how valid is that prediction based on our reserving results? And the answer is quite. Uh, if you map today's record onto this predicted range, you see that 100% of the presences of this species fall within that predicted range. 94% of the absences are also fall outside of that predicted range. And again, it's the minimal temperature for the coldest month that seems to be the most important variable. Winters are warming, and in some way, this is having a potential impact on the species. Okay? And this impact is global to this species. So it's not only true for Yosemite, but it's also true for the Southern Sierras, the Southern Rain Partners range. These are the occupancy uh, models uh, that are projected uh, for the historic data in blue and the, uh, and the modern data uh, today across the elevation of gradient. You can see that the species has moved upwards in its range, its occupied range, both in Yosemite and in the Sequoia Kings Canyon area. So this pattern affects this entire species range. This is one of the few endemics uh, to California. All right, so what else can we do? So the question, second question I ask is, um, has to do with some of the ideas about conservation, concerns about conservation uh, biology, is whether or not these species that are being impacted, where the rains are retracting or shifting, are they going to be impacted genetically that might impede them from being able to adapt to the changing conditions. So we have genetic diversity loss, uh, is range factor major due to more differentiation among populations and amount of gene flow, <coughs> functional or adaptive polymorphisms loss, which reaches to the genome for signatures of adaptation and so forth. And we can do this kind of analysis because we have these large series of specimens that for health collection that we can obtain a DNA from. Uh, and that's been done. We can compare that to the specimens that we collect today. So they're contrasting these two species of chipmunks again. The lost old pine chipmunk that hasn't changed at all. We don't expect any change at all in genetic diversity or a lot of differentiation among local populations. But for the alpine chipmunk, we expect a decrease in diversity as populations shrink and lose diversity just by chance alone. Uh, we expect increased differentiation because of the population shrink. Uh, gene flow connectivity is reduced. And that's exactly what Emily found. Uh, she used the leading diversity as a measure in the microsatellite low side of the DNA, and there is about a 50% reduction in diversity uh, in the alpine chipmunk over the time period, and no change at all in the logical uh, uh, chipmunk. And the amount of interpopulation differentiation has gone up fourfold in the alpine chipmunk. So those predictions hold reasonably well. So what have we learned? Let's stop here in a second. The species responses over the past century have not been uniform. They've been rather idiosyncratic. Not everyone has moved, or if they have, they've not always moved in the same direction. These shifts are real, at least statistically. They correlate with landscape and or climate change, suggesting causal linkages. And there are measurable potential significant consequences that might affect the species' future, at least in the context of the alpine ship. What we don't know is when these changes took place. They could have occurred the year after Grinnell stopped his surveys, or they could have started the year before we started ours, or they could have been one of time over the last century. And we know I don't remember your high school geometry, you can draw any shape of a curve you want. We also don't know why these changes have taken place. We can come up with all kinds of scenarios as to why, but for most of these species, they've never been studied in the field until now, so we really don't know very much about them. And so it remains for future surveys to see if these predictions of going from the past to the present and then being able to predict the future uh, hold or not. <clears throat> I hope that some of you uh, talked with Rachel uh, Walsh and, and Kelly Hammond and saw their little exhibits because they're the two people who are studying now the, the population biology of these two chipmunk species on the Sierras. And for the first time, uh, we'll know something about the basic biology of these animals that might give us some ideas as to, uh, as to 
supply, they can respond to the way they can. <clears throat> so I want to get back in these closing uh, moments uh, to redraw the connection between Yosemite and, and Berkeley. Uh, these are the four individuals that played the uh, most prominent role in the resurvey effort on uh, getting us on board. David Graver, who was the, uh, um, the uh, uh, chief scientist for the Pacific Western Region of the Park Service. Uh, he's a direct lineal descendant or academic lineal descendant. <coughs> PhD here. John Magandan, also a PhD here from Berkeley, he's a fire ecologist. He was in charge of the USGS uh, field station, uh, Yosemite field station, and initiated uh, the research project through uh, the two people that work for him, a uh, husband and wife team, Les Chow and Peggy Moore, uh, both of whom got degrees here at Berkeley, and both of whom uh, I've been very, my wife and I have been very fortunate to spend every summer with in the field uh, for the last uh, 10 years. And I, Michael, <laughs> Michael already stole this uh, from me, uh, but I, I didn't know that he was going to make any comments about, uh, uh, before this happened. But we just hired, uh, back fortunately, uh, Michael Nockman as the true sixth director of the museum. It's a 105 year history. And as he mentioned in his uh, comments um, uh, earlier, uh, he's, he, he was, he's a uh, Yosemite file. Started, he, he told me he started. Uh, Running bicycles in Curry Village uh, as a high school student or something like that. And he's out there and spent years with the season's bridge. He's also uh, a UC undergraduate. So I want to leave you just with two things. Uh, there, there are two sets of quotes that I love. Uh, we talk a lot about today uh, major deficits and disorder uh, because you know, people spend all their time in front of a TV show. Uh, they don't know what the video game things are. I don't know. Uh, but back in 1915, uh, Walter Taylor was describing major deficit disorder in the national park system, and he was actually worried about it. And it has to do with the disadvantage of seeing the country through the two, what he called the tourist eye. This comes directly from his field notes. He said, Paul rapidly from place to place in a noisy train and public automobile, the casual observer may well get the impression that there is no life at all in the park. Most tourists especially true of automobile tourists who recognize, I love that word, recognize nature through the windscreen. Far better it is to settle down quietly in one locality being content not to see everything at once and earnestly strive to look out upon one's environment with the seeing eye, the hearing ear, and the mind that understands and at least attempts to uh, try to understand. I've read all 3,000 plus pages of the Cornell era notes having to do with Yosemite. This is my and the last line of thought is, comes from again from George Melinda and Wright, the wildlife biologist who now is with the Nobel Science. And he says, if we destroy nature blindly, it is a boomerang which will be our undoing. Consecration, consecration to the task of adjusting ourselves to the natural environment so that we secure the best values of nature without destroying it is no, is not, un, is not, I said unless, it's not supposed to be useless, is not useless idealism. It is good for civilization. In this lies the true potential of this national park's effort. It is far better to pursue such a course, though success uh, be but partial, than to relax and despair and allow the destructive forces of the op to operate on check. So, uh, as somebody who's about ready to check out of this world, I look at all of you who are still deeply engaged in it, uh, keep engaging in it, keep engaging those who are you in. It's possible. With that, I just thank all the people uh, that were engaged in the project, and one either in Yosemite or else places, uh, else places in uh, California, and particularly you know, the funding agencies, including the, the Park Service, um, you know, Yosemite Fund, and now Yosemite Institute, uh, National Geographic, which funded the second part of the, of the survey, or the surveys in Yosemite um, and the National Science Foundation. And then, for any of you who are interested uh, to the museum's website, direct link to the Grinnell Survey Project, and that gives you a link then to all the areas in the state, the reports and other kinds of media and so forth that are associated with what's been done uh, over these trends. And uh, <coughs>
because they're still there, but the dominance of yellow pine. But the other thing, is, as I understand it from Yosemite Valley, what, in the 1890s or whatever, they blew up the terminal moraine, yeah. uh, and 
and that dried the meadows out. And once you dry the meadows out, then the conifers seed really quickly into the meadows. Uh, I don't know. I don't know anything at all about Native Americans' uh, activities in the high uh, montane meadows, whether they burn those on a regular basis or not. I just, How did the, all the grazing that went on? Well, the, the, so in the, in the late 1800s, there was heavy sheep grazing, uh, even in places like Fallowing Meadows. That was gone by the time, that, that was outlawed when Yosemite became a regular national park in 1891? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the grazing was stopped then, so Grinnell came 15 years afterwards. Uh, but the answer is yes, all of these things, you know, are likely to impact. And, you know, if we think about it, you know, we have this desire to restore things, but you know, restore it to what, you know? And that's a big dilemma. I want to just, uh, restore some of the meadow to the way it was before I played out Yeah, there. exactly. <laughs> that was one baseline. Yeah. I was going to say those pines must be a result of you. <laughs> I, I, I had so much impact there, I don't know about by myself. Uh, we are, probably should wrap up, but any, any last questions? One thing I would like to just add, I think, and Dan, if you, you know, first I just want to again thank all the people who made this possible. And I want to thank Lisa for protecting the Yosemite National Park by herself. <laughs> Future plans to uh, to do more.